YouTube stream health is excellent. George Teague says, what's up? Kathy Weathersby says, happy Wednesday and roll tide. The Bama Standard Network says, roll tide. Okay. That means we are cooking with gas. What if I want to cook with gas? What if I want to cook on an electric stove? Well, that would be less efficient, right? Oh, and my printer's out of paper. That's fine. We'll handle it during the uh, during the intro. Why? Why do we need paper? I, I got I got notes. I got, I got <laughs> notes. <laughs> what, like, what we, oh, okay. You do me for a loop right now. Like, what they gotta do with it? But all right. Well, anyway. we'll tell the tell the people what they're here getting getting night so we can roll the intro. Okay. So. Appreciate you guys for hopping in right now, man. I, I'm going to go ahead and apologize in advance because I'm sniffing. Um, and I don't have COVID. I did have that checked out. But I just think I got a good cold, and so I'm a little congested. So if you hear a lot of that or see me wiping my nose or whatever, I apologize in advance. Um, but we got a lot of things that we want to talk about, uh, some good stuff today, um, as always, I think. But we're going to go in a different order. Too. JT and I talked about this, so we're actually going to show this little film first on uh, Rico Scott out the beginning. Just give some takes on him. We won't watch all of his highlight reels because it is very, very long, uh, but we'll get through and give you our opinions on that. Then we need to talk about the coaching staff. What does this really mean? You know, I I, I kind of kidded with JT a little bit about it. OC, co-OC. Assistant head coach, all these titles, what does actually all of this kind of stuff mean? And then we want to get into the 4-2-5 defense and kind of break this down a little bit for you. JT has got some graphics for you on that too. So let's go ahead and get to it and let's start Teague's take right now. So look at here. Guess what I did? It, it's been like 30 years since I've actually did something this past weekend. Me and Consuela went to an Alabama basketball game in Tuscaloosa. Oh, man. It was pretty doggone awesome. I felt bad a little bit because the stadium, um, we, we need to up do, upgrade our stadium a little bit. It's time. I know that um, Greg Byrne is trying to do – a lot to get us a new Coliseum and things of that nature. I love the history, but I think it's just time for us to upgrade that piece a little bit. You know what? We put it on Texas A&M, and, um, and uh, it was very fun. It was electric um, in there. If you haven't been to a game, you need to go. It's pretty cool. I, I, I was very pleased um, with the atmosphere. I just think the building needs to be um, – caught up a little bit. So that was pretty fun for us to go home, see family. JT and I might tell a couple stories um, on that, but um, it's really just to hear about and see family, uh, sports. Man, it was a, an awesome, awesome time. So speaking of family, you guys know that my uh, co-host, someone that I'm very close to and I uh, absolutely love and love what we do on Wednesday nights with this Teague's take is my son, JT. He likes to be called James sometime. Come on, show us your face, man, so we can see what's up. Yes, sir. You know, JT's here. You need to give yourself a round of applause like we do for everybody, uh, uh, I guess. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I see Kelly saying I always come back with a sniffle. So, let, so let, let, let's go ahead and address that before we get into this, JT, because I don't know how you felt about it. So there, there are a couple things that I do like, I love about going back to um, Alabama. One, you know, just family is the first part I talked about. Uh, sports, getting to go to games, things of that nature. And I do actually love seeing the trees and the greenery and stuff of that nature. A lot of the stuff we don't necessarily have a lot of out here. Uh, in Texas because it can be very much a lot of concrete 
although it's her green. The part that I don't like is this, because when I do go to Alabama, the allergies are like off the chart because of all of the green. So did you have any issues uh, with your nose and sniffles? I, and stuff I, right now? I did not because um, I went back to the allergy and asthma doctor um, last month and I got retested for all the things and I'm still just as allergic as I was before. Um, but I'm on a pretty good uh, medication regimen so that uh, these things don't happen to me as bad as they used to. So I was <laughs> I was good to go. Well, I wasn't good to go. It just hit me a little bit harder. Uh, well, I got time. Emily too, and Emily don't even she don't even have allergies like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, any other uh, particular highlights about the trip that you may want to share? That you know, just one or two good things that you. Yeah, to. it was it was cool to see my children with their great great grandmother. Uh, that's that's always nice, and even with their with their great grandfather. Um, you know, I I know th- uh, the children probably aren't going to remember um, this trip, but I will, and they will. The the grandparents. So, um, you know, it was good to see them because I hadn't. I don't know when the last time I saw Granny was, um, but I don't think I've seen Granddad in probably about seven years. So. Okay. It's always good to go back and see him. All right. Well, that's good. And Granny's 92 and my dad is 82. Um, so it's pretty cool to see that um, as well. But JT, we got some uh, to, some things to, to talk about today. And because we want to switch this up, if you don't mind, I really do want to get onto to a little bit of film first. Um, cause I, I was watching, um, Rico. So let me, before we even show the film though, uh, we were told a little earlier that some people were really kind of down and out about players on our team. What does the roster really look like? You know, things of that nature. I, I don't necessarily feel that way. I, I feel like the, the Alabama football team is still built to be able to win games on talent. Okay, um, we, I think it was a couple of shows ago when I was actually talking about the number of three stars, four stars that you actually had, and it seemed to be pretty high. And these guys that we're studying from week to week seem like they could be pretty good contributors at the SEC level um, as well. So I'm not panicking because of talent. What, what about you? Do you feel, am I wrong? Am I being a homer and just saying we're going to be good or – no, I mean the yeah we we did lose some some key guys um, that we thought we were going to be contributors, but I think the biggest thing to me is that the class that was already brought in, uh, you only lost you lost two guys out of that class. Everybody else is is still here. So unless unless you're you were already on the side of. Saban brought in a bad class, then I guess that that's that to me, that's the only way that you can draw that conclusion. Right. I mean, there's the, the players that are coming in were already high level and you didn't lose very many of them. So mm-hmm. going forward, there's things that need to be seen of what um, the staff can do and what kind of class they can put together for, uh, 2025 and beyond, but this 2024 class is is intact. It's still a what was it? I don't know. I can't remember if it was number one or number two, but I think it was a top three class anyway. Um, so, right. and I think even with the losses, it's still a top three class. That's right. And we're gonna hit on that a little bit. How does this fit? How will this fit with the coaching staff and all this kind of stuff? Because I, I don't know. I guess I got a a few takes on on that and what that's going to look like. But one of the guys that we want to highlight and show, um, although we're going to be talking defense on this on the later part of the show, let's go ahead and uh, talk about a little bit of offense and this gentleman who's already on campus, Rico Scott, right? He's a four-star athlete. And you can really see the difference between a four-star and a five-star JT. It's kind of incredible um, on that. So I'm kind of glad that this um, that they actually showed this here first. It, where they said running back 
or wide receiver. Mm -hmm. But when I first actually thought of this, it made me start thinking of, I'm not saying he's him, right? But Debo Samuel, the way this guy is actually being used in the backfield, uh, in the slot, out wide, running tunnels. There's a lot of things that you see that this high school actually used him um, as. So I don't know how much of this you actually watch. Yeah, you know me. I, I try not. I try not to watch this uh, beforehand at all. The the only I saw maybe the first three clips because I had to transcode the video to get it in here. But um, well, and look at the first. You said the first three clips. Did you see what happened? They had him in three different positions in the first three clips. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, running back. Outside receiver, slot receiver, and he's already ran uh, three different routes, I guess. Uh, you know, with the drag. Mm -hmm. And um, this one, I, I think this is the one I stopped on. This is the whip. Oh, yeah. Very good. You know, catch it with his hands. Now, the one thing I wanted to say was this film quality, man, good Lord. I, I don't know. Maybe there's a parent film. Or whatever. I'm like, is this like really like huddle film? What What are we doing here? <laughs> we got to increase their budget a little bit because this is garbage. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you know, look at this stuff, man. It's kind of crazy. But you get to see who he is and what he does. So we've kind of seen a lot of different routes, you know, under. So – uh, I've seen him catch it with his hands, JT. Mm -hmm. I've seen him running a lot of different routes. What I don't see, okay, which which we always talk about in the other film, is a lot of a lot of they have shown some a lot of the breakaway. I'm going. I'm running past a lot of people. Typically, you see that on highlight reels, you know, where they're showing their speed by no means am i saying he's slow i'm just saying that uh you hadn't seen a lot a lot of that you know some of this right here he likes to have the contact yeah well i mean and i think you need some of those um you need some of those receivers on your on your team that are not afraid of contact because what i do like is that he's just he he's catching the ball. He's just turning up field and getting yards. He's not trying to dance or anything like that. And he's not afraid to to initiate contact or take a shot. So if you can get a guy that can actually that's not afraid to run across the middle, well, there you go. There's, you see, you. there's breaking two angles right there. Well, there's a little bit of a little bit of speed. Yeah, some good blocking. <laughs> oh, he just, yeah. he I, I thought speed, he was running around there at first, which which is. <laughs> which is good because I'm just looking at him thinking that he's running a route. And I was like, I don't know if you can do that at the top of the route. But <laughs> uh, yeah. Clearly it's a, it's a run play and he's blocking. So, you know, I, I do, you know, so far I do like this, uh, this Debo comparison. Cause he does, he looks like a big kid. I don't know what he's listed at. I don't know how, what his height and weight is. Uh, I wanted to say six foot, 185 pounds or something. Yeah. Jesus. I think I can look, which is not small by any means. No. Um, and he's probably going to hit some weights uh, with that. So I, I think he's very versatile, you know, and it's someone that you can use in a lot of different ways uh, because of that, you know, strength. So it just reminds me of bigger type of wide receivers who can make you miss if you don't tackle well. Um, he can possess the ball. You see here, he can find the openings. <laughs> you know, he's still getting up the field, right? You know, breaking angles. So it, it's, it's a. Uh, yeah, I want to. Um, I want to pause just a second for this comment. This great overtime win because I was watching the Alabama game and I was like, great, they're gonna finish. Yeah. They're gonna hit this game winner right before we got to get on. I can watch the whole game and it'll be great. And then. Sears gets his uh, shot smacked into the second row at the end of the game. And I was like, well, we're going to overtime, and now I'm not going to get to see what happens. Um, well, it looks like they won. Well, that was Dave. 
uh, Dave, we appreciate you for giving us the update. We know we needed that win uh, because we need to go ahead and get this championship, the SEC championship. Um, I think it's going to come down to us in Tennessee. Is that right? Oh. Uh, you know, someone might can tell us. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this route right here. Uh, yeah. So I kind of like the way that he kind of stemmed, you know, up, boom, back back up to the post. I mean, that, that's – Both feet down. Yeah, both feet down, catching the ball with the hand. So there, there's just a lot, a lot of really good things here. I think he's get the right coaching and the right uh, weight room. That This guy is going to be pretty doggone good too. And they just got to figure out how they want to use him. It just seems like he could be a multiple threat kind of guy. And the way Kalen – excuse me, Coach DeBoer likes to uh, – run bubbles and things of that nature, I could see him doing a lot of that in this scheme um, that they're going to be putting in on offense that he, he should be able to fit pretty good. Um, it's the same route. So when I'm watching these films, man, JT, you're a coach. If you watch this, you're going to see the same route over and over mm -hmm. and over again. I'm looking at the teams. I'm like, is nobody watching film? Come on, man, because, <laughs> you know, but – Anyway, and I was trying to figure out which color they are because they've had on yellow pants, they've had on yellow uniforms, blue uniforms, white uniforms. I, I love to have a change up, but I don't know, man. I guess that's my Alabama side. Let's just keep it simple, you know. So, all right. I love the whip route, too. Those nope, are pretty good. And there's a one hand, there's a little one hand grab, which. Ed, I mean, that grab is not particularly difficult, but that shows you confidence in his ability just to catch the did, ball. Okay, did you just see that route again? Uh, this is like the is that fourth, the same uh, the same post route. <laughs> yeah, I He's started getting slot, frustrated. Middle the field's I'm open. Like, We're gonna you, stem inside of this dude. Step oh, out. There oh. it is. <laughs> I'm like, come on, two hands, feet in the ground. Come on, man. I'm like these coordinators, they. And that's why we go talk a lot of defense um, because they're not. Because this might be a deep over or a whip or up or another screen. Yeah. We probably should have, I should have tallied like how many, how many different routes did we actually see in six minutes worth of highlights? Yeah. His highlight reel is, is probably too long for us to really see, but you see who, who we're looking at here. And I think, you know, watch him in the spring and see what happens here. You see it? Another yeah. Whip, whip on the goal line. <laughs> I mean, the tendencies are bad, bro. Come on. Uh, but whatever. It is what it is. Okay, so we can, uh, unless you just want to continue to watch. Oh, we got 53 seconds left, so. Okay. So the whole thing about it is when you're looking at this, you see a possession type guy, someone who could run a lot of different routes. He's going to be a multiple person. If you were to watch someone like a uh, Ryan Williams film, um, you would see speed like all the time. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know? I, I guess we have to give the disclaimer that uh, Ryan Williams was supposed to be talked about today, but uh, we had some issues screen recording, so we'll, we'll try again later. That's right. Um, so, uh, I mean, you get it. It just, he's a different guy. There's no good or no bad. It just, it means you got versatility that you can use guys in different ways. There, there is something about having a guy that can run over the top consistently. That was nice, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, but I, I imagine that's why I put another star on you when you run, just running past people like that. Um, like uh, Ryan, might be doing or that you see he had so much just speed kickoff returns pop returns catching the ball and just you know breaking every angle um so i feel good about our guys even the more that we start looking and studying with the new class that's coming in not just with the returns but the new guys that are coming in i can see why there's a lot of optimism um about what we have um there so that is going to lead me into another piece, right? Because I start to feel good, man. JT, I got to pause for one quick second. I got to pause for one quick second. Um, 
one thing we hadn't done is we hadn't been in a pool in a while. As many hotels I've been in, it seems like I should have been in a hot tub or jacuzzi or something um, of this nature, but I, I haven't had that. I hadn't even been in a beach. When's the last time you've been to the beach, by the way? I don't remember. Uh, I was with I was with Emily and Pac Man and Glenn and Trevor. So twenty. 17, 2018, maybe? Well, okay. So if you were living a little bit further south, you'd have the opportunity to go ahead and bring the beach to you. I, I You know what? I did go to the beach. Uh, I went to Rosemary Beach uh, with your mom twice, two years in a row now. I'm too dark, man. I don't be hanging out on the beach laying out <laughs> <laughs> uh, suntanning. So it'd be nice just to have one in my own backyard um, and you could have one too. So we're very thankful and we're happy about what Beaches LLC has to offer you, particularly if you're in uh, Alabama or in the northern part of Florida. Let's take a moment to hear what they have to offer. Let me tell you about Beaches LLC. Yes, Beaches LLC is your source in the state of Alabama and the Florida Panhandle for exquisite quartz sand beach pools by Biodesign USA. A Biodesign beach sculpted pool is crafted with beach entries, customized seating areas, and swimming zones, and they all can be personalized to your swimming needs. The Biodesign swimming pool is meant to immerse you in your surrounding environment. The illusion of a truly beautiful beach can be created and extended onto the patio area, creating one seamless shore environment. Let them help you turn your dream backyard escape into reality with an eco-friendly, more durable, less time, and less expensive to maintain, totally customizable pool. To learn more about turning your dream into a reality, please visit their website at www.yourbackyardbeach.com. So I'm not sure if you paid attention to any of those pictures and see which one you actually like, but it's a pretty fancy little uh, beaches, <laughs> you know, pools that are, are amazing. So uh, one day I'm going to work my way uh, down South, find me a nice little place where I can have one of those. Cause I think that's going to be absolutely, absolutely amazing. So I want to say thank you to, uh, Beaches LLC for their continued support of uh, Teague's Take. But also take, take this moment just to say, hey, uh, those of you on the Bama Standard, appreciate you guys as well. We're always thankful for our friends over at the Bama Standard. Uh, make sure you're giving follows and likes and subscribing, uh, not to just to our channel here on Teague's Take, but also to theirs. There's a lot of great content Um on both channels, so you need to be really, really locked in with uh, both stations. Okay, so we're gonna keep rolling. I know with it, we're trying to um, make sure JT can hear exactly what I'm saying. Is that a thumbs up? Yes, you can hear me, or no, you can't. Oh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so um, this is. JT, let's go ahead and start talking about the coaches a little bit. Um, so they just uh, announced the hiring of Nick Sheridan, Jamarcus Shepard, um, this past uh, uh, officially, I guess, bringing them on here a couple of days ago or so. So what I want to ask you about is not necessarily what they were going to run because we know what, what's going to happen. What about these titles? What does it actually really mean? It's a pet peeve for me, right? I'm looking at Nick Sheridan, offensive coordinator, quarterback coach. Okay, that's great. But then you got Jamarcus Shepard who's coming in, who's a co-OC, wide receivers coach, and assistant head coach. It seems a little bit backwards to me that you can be co-OC, assistant head coach, and not the OC head coach. Maybe I'm looking into it too much, but, but what does all this mean when you, you got a, a head coach who you know is probably going to call the plays, I think. <laughs> then you got an OC, then you got a co-OC. What, what the heck is really going on? 
Well, I think I think there's a couple of things. One we've already talked about is um, w- titles in, entitle you to certain amount of payment, so they can't they can't pay you uh, like an OC if you're just the wide receivers coach. Um, so they give you the title so that you can have a little bit more. I think I think um, what if you're a head coach who's probably going to call either the offensive or the defense court, uh, defensive plays anyway. Um, not that any high level coaches need to do this, but if I was a head coach and I was also going to call plays, I would still name somebody else, the offensive coordinator or the defensive coordinator so that I have a scapegoat. If things don't go well, then the, Hey, me, Tim, <laughs> I've, you know, you, you do the, you do the old Mike McCarthy. And it's like, look, you, you see me on the sideline with the play, with the play sheet, but Nussmeyer is still going to be the OC. Right. Even though I got the call sheet on, on the sideline, um, you know, just in case. Um, but I think most of it is all just trying to be able to pay guys. So you got to give them, got to give them titles. Okay. Uh, I 100% agree. But so when you go to like a Jamarcus Shepard, what, so let's try to break down like what would be the difference between a pass game coordinator versus run game coordinator versus what this system they're putting in place, offensive coordinator versus co-offensive coordinator. What, what does that mean when you're a co-offensive? I mean, what is a co? <laughs> I mean, your third person, if the coach is really going to be calling, what, what the heck does a co-offensive coordinator do? I, I got the money, uh, I'm saying, but in real sense, you got to be telling them something other than we're just going to yeah, you, you can't you can't title. be OC, you can't be co OC, and then also just still do receivers, right? Like you, so, you still yeah. got to do you got to do something to to justify uh, the title. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's a maybe they don't want to call it pass game coordinator and run game coordinator or anything like that. Um, but I'd imagine that's kind of how you split it up. It's like, hey, I need you to. Your job is going to be to scout coverages or whatever, do the report, and hand me what what plays, what passing plays you like against these looks under certain situations, um, personal packages, things like that. Because um, you know, then at the end of the day, whoever's calling the plays is still going to have the ultimate say on what gets called when but it now it's not all on you as the oc to do all of those things you can delegate some of the bigger tasks off to co coordinators <laughs> even you had to think about that right because it, it's just crazy uh to me because i i don't I mean, I'm happy for people that you you're getting your titles and you get the opportunity because that that builds your resume too. That mm-hmm. that can help you become a head coach. So you're trying to get those titles. I I get it. Um, it just I don't know what it does for hierarchy. I mean, we look at this from a high school standpoint. Sometimes who is really the the fall guy? Like you said, what happens when something ain't right? We're fans and we're trying to figure out why something don't go. I mean, well, is is Nick Sheridan also a co-offensive coordinator, or is he the offensive coordinator? It just says offensive coordinator. Uh, well, then, then, then you know, you know the hierarchy. Then, like, you got you got the the main guy, and then you got the other guy, because they're not both co-offensive coordinators. That would be weird. No, he's a co. Yeah, Jamarcus is the co-OC. You got you got head chef, and you got sous chef. You know, head chef walks around, makes sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Sous chef does the thing that people are supposed to be doing. <laughs> okay, but you're 
co-offensive coordinator is also the assistant head coach. Yeah, well, that, that's a tough one. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> but because the assistant head coach is supposed to be the guy, like you know, head coach is in the hospital or something. He's sick. Assistant head coach is supposed to be the guy that's supposed to be in charge, right? Yes. And this is why I'm going to uh, throw you for a big loop. Uh, Robert Gillespie, running back coach, who we're glad uh, they retained him, right? Work with our running backs, understand what it means to be an SEC running back and all that kind of stuff. His title is also running back and assistant head coach. Well, maybe one of them is a, uh, you know, trusted one's one's the uh one's the guy that is supposed to just tell you like hey man that's not how we do things around here and hey i know you don't know who that guy is but you probably should go talk to that guy because he 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 makes things happen around here so you know he he's the he's the culture guy the the don't rock the boat guy okay uh i can see it just i don't know it's just uh, maybe I'm so old school traditional that it just seems like you need. I understand the head coach, assistant head coach, OC, some some other kind of. I I don't know. It just it's just weird to me. But I, I'm pretty sure it's all money plays, as you said. I just hope it doesn't get confusing to people uh, in the building, which I'm sure it won't. I'm sure they keep that out. But for us even on defense. So Kane Womack is a defensive coordinator, inside linebackers coach. Maurice Linguist, how uh, you say his last name? Co-defensive coordinator. What's a co-defensive coordinator, bro? Uh, if I had a co-defensive coordinator, um, <laughs> well, depending since I coach safeties, um, two DB I, coaches. Oh well, well, you well, you said one of them was a was a he was an inside linebackers coach. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was I was reaching. I was figuring you were gonna say, well, well, yeah. I mean, we, I mean, our staff does split corners and safeties as two different two different uh, position groups. Um, but I would have him looking at more specific things about the front i would be i would be saying hey i i need a uh i need pass pro like wh where where does the running back insert on pass pro can you figure out when they like the slide versus fan versus mix or they do a little bit of big on big half, half man half slide kind of stuff and then say all right how can we how can we attack that um and trying to get a beat on the run game. And then I'd say, all right, well, I'm still going to do that. I'm not going to look as as hard at that. I'm going to be looking at what are their tendencies when throwing the ball. Can I try to figure out what they're going to do on, first, on third down and passing situations? Am I seeing the same four routes from their receiver on the goal line all the time? Um, and figure out what coverages I like from that. And then we can get together and say, okay, um, they like to do this in the run game. I know they like to do this pass game, kind of build the game plan together. Um, well, I shouldn't say build the game plan together. I would say I'd be able to take that information and then build the game plan based on that feedback. My co-defensive coordinator would be, um, will still tell me, hey, we like these kind of pressures. Um, that guy's weak. We should attack here. We should do that. And then I would say, okay, maybe I put that on a sheet. Maybe I don't. Um, and go for it that way, knowing that um, I'm still going to be the one to having having to to call fronts and coverages. Um, and then at halftime, well, like during the game, I would say his I'd be having his job to be looking at like what adjustments do we do we like that we already had on our in our game plan. 
what are the ones that we think are not going to work anymore or you know while i'm focusing on calling the game while we're live and the bullets are flying he should be focusing on what are the adjustments that we can make when we go into halftime or even between drives and we can yep. have have that kind of dialogue yep. i can't i can't go into that much depth on offense because i don't call offense so i don't yep. know how that dynamic is supposed to work well i just think what's going to be interesting during the season is who's upstairs and who's downstairs you know when you get mm -hmm. in this part. or are they both upstairs or are they both downstairs I, you know who who's your best person to be in the box when you have cold something and i'm only thinking about how the cowboys were with um uh dan quinn and joe witt they both are upstairs they didn't call joe witt a cold defensive coordinator, but that's probably essentially what he was. He was Dan Quinn's right hand man. He was a secondary coach, probably pass game coordinator, mm -hmm. or you know, he really had to look at the secondary piece. So he was upstairs um, in the box as a safety coach. But speaking of that, and wanting to look at and how do you try to find out about the defense? Let's talk about this four two five stuff and how much different this is going to be, if any, from what we've been accustomed to seeing in the, you know, under Nick Saban, right? Because I would say on, on paper that people would probably say Saban was a 3-4 guy, right? Yeah, um, but that, that definitely evolved. Um, like, I, I know that, like, the playbook says – three four and all that kind of stuff but over the last few years it was a i even hesitate to use these these numbers because i have uh, very strong opinions about about these particular numbers now um but it was a it was a four two five like when they lined up that's essentially what it was it was just two high safeties instead of one um but my my firm opinion is um these numbers don't matter <laughs> and i have and uh, i have um some of these graphics or little pictures um drawn up to kind of illustrate that those the numbers really mean nothing because it's really on how you line up is what you're saying. And what we're going to show you here is how you can even manipulate a 3-4 to look like a 4-3 or 4-2-5, depending on mm -hmm. you know how you do your personnel stuff. And so when I was first asked about it, well, when I was originally thinking, I, my mind went to, we've been playing 4-2-5. What are we talking ah, about? That's what, <laughs> and, you know, and, that's, it's, oh, yeah. and I get into these, I get into these debates. Well, I try not to get into these debates all the time um, because – and I don't want to be mean, but a lot of times when I get when I get into those conversations, it's immediately clear to me that that person doesn't really know what they're talking about. Because because yes, you read it and you say, okay, yes, Saban is a three four guy, uh, and Alabama's been running a three four, and it's like sure, but Dallas Turner's had his hand in the ground, and. The other and and Will Anderson also had his hand in the ground, and you had two into you had two fives, a three, and a one, and you had a nickel out here. So like it's call it a three four if you want to, but there's a, let's put it this way: there's only two types of defenses, odd, and an under front. That's it. Everything else is just kind of sugar coating on the back end. If you're either an odd or even spacing, and for the last nine years i think alabama's been predominantly in even spacing even yes regardless of where the personnel was uh, and i think that's why you know because that can be confusing um from a defensive standpoint if you're thinking it's something because you have to block different or you have to identify people differently from an offensive side when you're trying to identify mics and who mm -hmm. who the rushers and all that kind of stuff so it can get a little bit confusing. But let's talk about this just from a standpoint. The four four two five, um, I guess there's some weaknesses and some strengths. See, that's um, why I had to print out my papers. 
So, so let's. Uh, which way you want to start first? Then you want to. Well, let's let's talk about um. What what could be, bad, with the four traditional four two five right? Um, got four linemen, two linebackers, five defensive backs. Mm-hmm. As we're saying, typically we used to call that nickel back in the day. Um, <laughs> now it's just base. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's base. <laughs> um, so when you have the fifth DB, you're pulling off a linebacker, maybe. Yeah, or, maybe. Or, or, or something. Um, and so does that make you have any concerns, not you in general, but someone who layman terms said, okay, you don't have the same amount of size. Maybe does it make it hard to stop the run more difficult? Uh, what do you think? Could that be a weakness of a four to five? All right. So I've got, there's I've a got, great question by Jessica. Yes. Jessica says big backs, big old line or, or concern for four, two, five, right. Doesn't mirror. So attack the boundary. Okay. Um, I think this is before we even talk about the weaknesses. I think this is a great time to show the graphic because okay. the, the four, two, five, Oh, I'm showing, uh, showing the wrong stuff here. Depending on how you actually line up, whether you have middle of the field closed or not, um, is going to make a difference. So if you're going to play middle of the field closed in 425, which this is why I said um, most of this stuff doesn't, these numbers don't matter because if I didn't, if I just put X's up here on the board and didn't put letters and didn't color code it, Somebody's going to look at this and be like, oh, that's just a 4-4. Four, four. Be like, well, yeah, except we're going to call two of them safeties. So now it's not a 4-4, four, four, it's a 4 two, five. So I said these numbers are stupid. Um, but in the case of what Jessica Brand's talking about, if you're running a 4-2-5 like this, it absolutely does mirror. Um, and depending on how you're going to how you're going to play your run fits, which I won't get into because I did a whole clinic and I spent 54 minutes just talking about run fits so it can get really in depth. Um, the, the point I would be making here is the way that I do our run fits out of four, two, five. Um, you don't want to really attack the boundary. I've got, I've got an eight man. We'll call it an eight man box. Um, so since we're looking at it, uh, we're, talking about the weaknesses uh i've i've got five weaknesses um all right that i wrote down um and we have to define a term first meaning bubble um bubble is any gap that doesn't have a defensive lineman in it so um there are two bubbles in 425 at least drawn up this way traditionally um b gap week oh i have a pen oh yeah you forgot about that? I sure oh, did. Uh, B gap week, right here. It's a bubble. Um, and then we have B gap or A gap strong, it's right here. Because there's just there's no defensive line in here. Um, and then angles. So down blocking on the three tech by left to tackle is. An easy this is this is an easy down block, right? This angle is good. Um and then angling down on a one tech from the guard, also good. So I counted that as that that's two that's two more. And then the last one I have is uh the seams. So misalignment or technique issues can create can create horizontal or ver- vertical seams or leverage by a force defender. Um we call these guys out here force defenders. So um, this area here we're going to call seams um, because if you got bad technique out here if you just kind of turn and leave you're not reading your keys you know you get I'm just kind of making up a you know belly here you get an influence you squeeze you kick them out not very good if you if you got guys down here that's supposed to be part of the box that just bail um, I would like to think that we're going to teach our guys a little bit better than that this is things that i wrote down from coaching in high school right where a lot of times people ain't 
your your safeties aren't reading run pass. They're all they think they're pass first and they just leave and run with a receiver. Um so those are the those are the weaknesses that I have. Is there anything that you wanted to add to that before we get into strengths and adjustments? Uh no, I the only thing I, I wanted to make sure I, I point this out for um Jessica is that I, I think I know where she's where she said something about it being um uh uneven <clears throat> is really because of the um, I guess you can't really see it, but maybe you can show it. If, it, if there was a too high shell that you got to do something a little bit yeah. different than if you're looking at Bama, if one of the if, the, if the R was back and the free safety was slid left or the other way, I let don't me, know. Let me, get to, <clears throat> let me get to that because, uh, look, there it goes. Yeah, so I'm sure that's what they're talking about, about the – what she is mentioning about yeah about attacking the boundary and this is actually um this is this is what i base out of here um and i think this is probably the look that we were getting from alabama most of the time um depending on you know there's a lot of things that you can look at here um but what we it's really paramount that you teach this guy how to read run pass and what his keys are. Um, yes. We teach to look at the quarterback because these days the quarterback is the most polished guy on the field. Um, I did a whole uh, study with at least some of the film that we get is within 0.6 seconds. The quarterback is going to tell you run or pass very quick. Um, and we're going to trigger very quickly. That's why we don't have our guys at 15 yards. Um, Did you play them at eight or 10? <laughs> or uh, how did it vary? It varied, but no deeper than yeah. 10. It was only, I only let you get to 12 if this guy was a speedster and you thought you were going to get run past. And most of the time, that guy is not a speedster. This guy over here in space is the speedster. Um, so if you didn't have a number two, this guy walks up like we, especially if it's a tight end, if it's a tight end, we're going to get to like seven, right? which is you ba basically damn near call him a linebacker at that point. Uh, so there are ways that we can um, adjust to kind of take away some of these bubbles, right? We can take this, uh, we can take this tackle and put him in a two eye, shade him this way, close this bu bubble down a little bit. Um, and then we can also go to um, an indie front, which would actually move this guy also to a two eye. I didn't pull that um, slide, even though I have them. Um, yep. To shorten these bubbles, right? That's that's an easy way to to uh, make to shrink those bubbles a bit. But it also and does. And that, and he's saying that. Like I'd say to the listeners, what he's not talking about is also. <clears throat> which we won't need to get into is movement when you're running people or running loops or, or gaps with the front people to mm -hmm. try to mess shorten up the, Yeah. And it also shortens the distance of that. They got to go. If you're going to try to slant or twist and stunt and do all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I've got, I've got one, two, three, four, five strengths. Um, four, two, five is a balanced defense. It has no significant numbers or leverage weak weaknesses versus base formations, meaning this, Spread, you want to get into um, um, 11 personnel or anything like that. Anything that's not out of the ordinary, you're not inherently going to have leverage problems or number problems. Um, it's an eight-man front. I'm still going to call it an eight-man front, even with the safety back here, because of how we play this guy. He is supposed to be aggressive. Um, and then you've got numbers inside with four defenders inside um, from B-gap to B-gap. So yep. this is B-gap. This is B-gap. If I draw a line, I've got four guys in here. And our philosophy has always been defend the middle of the field because, as you've heard me say many times on this show, who is the best tackler on the team? Uh, hash marks? No. <laughs> <laughs> the sideline. The sideline never misses a tackle. Oh, that's um, and you've got you've got no strong off tackle bubble with a three tech defensive end um, or a, a seven. You can play them in a six or a seven. I like to play them in a seven. It's just easier to teach. Um, and then all of your defensive linemen are outside shaded. 
um, to take away angles by down blocks from the defender that they're over. So they can only get they can only get down blocked by the next man over, which is going to open up um, a gap somewhere. Yep. Okay, so <clears throat> I mean, I love this defense. Uh, I think you got to have the right personnel. Obviously, that, that and this is, I guess, I want to get into this a little bit. The the how you have to align. Well, let me see. How important is it to have someone? And we'll answer this question in just a second. Bring that back up in a second. Okay. Like the difference in your S and your R, okay? Because typically, typically you're probably going to have someone opposite each other because of what you just said. One guy's got to cover more, mm -hmm. right? But he's got to be a run defender. So it's going to be a little bit of hybrid something, maybe. I don't know. That's why I'm asking you what you think. You know, between the S and the R. So maybe I'll give mine. When, when I was running it just a little bit before you, you know, R, my R was one of the best players on the doggone football field. Felt like he needed to play man-to-man. -man. He needed to blitz. He needed to stop the run. He needed to play deep half. <laughs> he needed to do it all. We didn't have our S do as much of that. That was like our Charles Daniels, who was at UAB. Mm -hmm. More linebacker type guys. But still could play man, like you said, when you go one high. We weren't worried about him covering the slot. But you weren't going to run to him because he was a oversized safety. And a lot of times we would stick him into the boundary <laughs> just because of what Jessica was talking about. Not all the time, but some of the time, or if they had tendencies. So, anyway, how do you feel about those position groups and how you uh, put people when you're looking at S's and R's? So, great question, because I, I have I have notes. Um, I know you do. I know, because I, I put them in the playbook. And so, when I tell my <laughs> coaches, like, look, this is, this is the kind of guy you're looking for, they know. Um, so RS, Sam, star, nickel, whatever. Um, the three bullet points I tell them is, um, this is a guy who could play safety or will linebacker. Which one is this? The, the S. Okay. Could play safety or will linebacker. He has to be able to win versus the three by one bubble. Meaning number three is going to run a bubble. And number two is going to try to come block him. He's got to be able to get off that block and, and get to that bubble. Um, and for us, this is this is why, to me, the it's harder to find a S than it is an R because of the way that we play it. He has to be able to carry uh, number two vertical in a three-by-one set yep. because we play a lot of quarters. Um, now, the Rover, the R... Um, he's kind of got two bullet points three really I mean one of them says game plan dependent but that doesn't mean anything to anybody but me <laughs> um, he is the best tackling safety because mm -hmm. he's into the boundary he's he's the alley defender there's fewer people over there he's got to be the one that's got to tackle um, and he is somebody that could play S. So if you want to think about it that way, he's got to be the best tackler and he could go over there and play S if you needed him to. Um, and then the th third billet point is all caps tackle two exclamation points because that guy the way I, I really just say that guy's got to be the best tackler on the team. Um, well, because he's going to have to fit your backside B gap sometimes too. Yes. Yep. He's got to fit um, he's got to fit here. And he's got to fit there. Yep. It ain't that easy. Some people think it's easy, but it's not that easy. Yeah, no, it's it's easy to fit front side. Backside in that cutback is because you get that cutback and it's you one on one. <laughs> if you're the safety, you miss. Uh, it's a it's a big deal. 
Ooh, I see you, David. Okay, uh, what was uh? Did we answer uh, the Bama standards uh, question? No, we didn't. Um, which Alabama defenders do you feel like will thrive most in this defense? Um, I really think it depends on whether or not he's playing single high or uh, or too high or a mix of both. Um, mm. But I think in general, it's going to be. I'm trying to think of what uh, Coach Kane Womack calls it because, and I know Jessica knows, because uh, he he does, he uh, one of them's the Sting. And the other one's the wolf, I think. And Sting plays on the weak side, and Wolf plays on the strong side, which to me is just bonkers. That's backwards. Yeah, but that's the way they do it. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's going to be. I still think it's going to be this guy here. Um, just simple. Um, and so Malachi Moore, I think, is going to be probably playing that position. Uh, I'm gonna say one of the because. He's going to be to the strong side. Um, I'm. This is a little bit of a made-up number. I don't know what it is in college, but in high school, it's like 70% of runs go to the strong side. So runs are coming to you. Um, you're going to be playing in space, which is where teams like to throw the ball most of the time is to space. Uh, so this guy, this guy right here has got to be, he's got to be an athlete in today's game. That. That guy is is one of the most important. Um, and I also think whoever is going to be playing at your free safety spot, middle open or closed, um, is also going to be getting a lot of action. Because if you're going to play with him in the middle of the field, he's damn near got to be the best athlete. Because now he's your ninth defender in the box. He's got to cover a lot of ground, hash to hash. And he's got to get down there and help helping the run. So those two, I think are, uh, are probably who's going to thrive the most. Husky. Husky is their new star. There you go. I don't know. Uh, we're going to have to change that. We know where we got Husky from. Well, he's from USA. That's not even, he, he's not from Washington. I guess coach might be, uh, yeah, I get it. And plus, Husky make me feel like I'm kind of a little overweight or something. <laughs> I ain't Husky myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but anyway, I, I do, um, I like the 425 is the, the main thing I'm saying. And there are a lot, and we're only just touching the surfaces of just oh, yeah. uh, lining up, you know, because yeah. there's, there's so many different, ways you can cover and blitz and mm -hmm. who's coming and you know who's the free safety look at him over here getting fancy with his stuff right here. well yeah i just i just wanted to show that like just because you're in a four two five go back to the other one where it looks like a three three yeah doesn't mean that you can't just pop a guy over like if you just slide everybody over half a man you're in a three four yeah so this or, is like since since uh that guy that husky is a uh a defensive back and you popped off an end who's now an outside linebacker it's a three three it's a three three five it's just not a stack but you know whatever right so uh, I which mean, i also it, have it, i have notes on the on the three three five two on what i think strengths and weaknesses are and adjustments well and those are and yes because that is well uh, there are a whole lot of pressures you can do from this look too. Mm -hmm. Most people don't. A lot of sims too. Yes. So, I mean, there's just so much you can do with it if you get the guys to comprehend it. And I think that might have been some of what we had last year that we talked about. It seemed like we were just, or maybe I talked about it, not not you simple we were always good we we're always talented but i don't know how elaborate we were and i'm not saying we need to be elaborate because you need guys to run fast and go make plays mm -hmm. <laughs> on defense but when you start confusing people that don't know where you're coming from then you got you know a chance but you but you could also get hurt because if you miss if you guess wrong yeah 
Uh, well, and and so one thing I we we do know about Coach Womack is uh, special from Coach Womack's defenses last year versus our defense uh, in the prior year. Um, Coach Womack is way more aggressive. Um, their havoc rate, which probably means nothing to people who don't look at any analytics, but that just means like how often they're getting to the quarterback, quarterback hurries, sacks, tackles for loss, things like that. They were top 30 in the country. Um, Alabama was like at 42, but um, I'm pulling this off the top of my head, so I can't remember the exact numbers, but they were they were blitzing at a much higher rate um, than Alabama had been. I think Alabama was blitzing like 14% of the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying, because look, I'm not a guy, I'm not a defense coordinator that likes to particularly blitz either. Um, but it's that this the coordinator's mindset, right? If the coordinator likes to dial up some pressures and get after you, like uh, uh, Steve Spagnola from uh, Kansas City Chiefs, like you just, third down, you know he's coming after you. Um, but you still got to deal with it. And if you're confident in that kind of stuff, then it's a big, you know, that can be a game changer. And what I liked from watching some of the um, USA game tape was when they brought pressure, those guys were, they were aggressive. You know, they weren't, they weren't going through the motions of blitzing. Like everybody took off on the snap of the ball and, and it looked like everybody thought that they were going to be the ones to get to the quarterback. And when you can blitz the quarterback with that kind of intensity, that becomes scary. Even if you're not actually getting there, just the fact that you have people coming at you with bad intentions is, yes. it, it can be a problem. That's when quarterbacks start seeing ghosts. Well, and that is the someone said up there the swarm defense is interesting too. That is what it's about when you're talking about swarming. <laughs> uh, I know the literal sense of swarm, everybody run to the ball, get there. Mm-hmm. But when you start uh, creating, when you're arriving with bad attitudes or you, you and you're given a perception like, hey, all of us are about to eat, <laughs> you know, it's uh, could be pretty good. So I'm. I think it's going to work out fine, man. I don't think it's going to be that much different for the guys. That like, because we said earlier, it's not that much difference of what they've been playing. Yeah, I mean, I think it looks like they're still going to play a lot of man anyway. So yeah, terminology might change some. That 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 would be one thing you'd have to look to see how they're calling something different than what they might have been calling in the past. But I guess that could change anytime. You, well, definitely when you lose a head coach. Um, because the head coach may dictate, even if he gets new coordinators, that we're going to call it this. So all of the terminology might shift. Uh, but at that point, as a player, it's really just knowing uh, what you used to call green is now red. <laughs> you yeah, know? And, you know, it, the, the thing that I've heard people um, be – a little worried about changing the names like i i i think for a lot of fans most of these names are sentimental because they've been doing this for 15 years right they've been calling it whatever they they've been calling it for 15 years um and you think that it's hard to change that terminology and as for for somebody who uh took over from coach ferris and what you guys were doing and I don't want to say essentially throwing everything out, but yeah, like getting away from stud and eagle and giving everybody, actually, literally everybody, a brand new position name. Like all 11 positions have a different name. Well, I guess nine of them because the corners are still corners, but whatever. Um, and then hold new coverages from even – my first year as the defense coordinator, the second year, the, it was all semantics. Like, we didn't have – it was very easy for them to forget uh, what, what was uh, – what they used to be called or anything like that. You just – you come in, you you teach it to them, 
they got way more time than they got way more time to study this than uh, we do in high school, right? So, um, for us to be able to pick it up in two days is not scary. Yes. So, I'm gonna answer what Corey was saying about his defensive tackle stuff. To me, I think you just really need a, a good, which I just put in the chat, good three technique. Mm -hmm. But you need that anyway because you need a good solid one technique too because you got angles like JT said at the beginning. You got people is you got people to angle on you and double team you a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I have, uh, you know, for your for your three tech, um, you want them to have enough size to play inside, but enough agility to play outside, meaning. Um, he's got to be big enough to be in the interior, but you want him to have enough agility to where he could play defensive end. Not saying that he is a defensive end, but he's got to have that kind of athleticism, um, and he's got to be able to get off blocks. He's got to be the guy that demands the double team. Um, and your one tech, that's the guy that you want to have some size, maths, and some strength. He's got to be able to hold the point. Um, you also want him to be able to demand a double team, but he's... To, for for me, he's got to be the best um, block eater. He's just got to be the guy that's in in the way, really. You, yeah, that's your big guys that you see in the league when they're playing one in there in the middle. The Jordan Davises or whatever the guy was at Georgia and mm -hmm. the Miles Smith from Michigan, the big old, big old boys. That <clears throat> uh, Kevin Smith says he would worry about shallow crosses and wheels out of the backfield. Um so two things I would say one schematically the four two five doesn't have a problem against this. Um, but Alabama as a football team <laughs> has some problem with it it any, anybody it out of the backfield the past few years. It, it didn't matter. Over. It didn't matter what defense it was running. They just weren't covering the back. Uh, you know, so you got, you got Bush, you got push calls and things like that for a reason where, Linebackers are supposed to get out of there. And I don't look, I really don't understand why people don't why we haven't been covering the back, especially if there's only one back in the backfield. It's like if that guy leaves, it ain't a running play no more. Unless, <laughs> you know, you got like Cam Newton or Tim Tebow or somebody back there in the backfield, but like or Jaden Daniels or somebody. But if you're playing South Carolina and they got Spencer Rattler, like they're not running him on a draw. So if the back leaves, you know he's trying to throw the ball. Yep. So probably should cover that guy. So four two five, uh the, to me, when it comes to that, what he's mentioning here, I think it's um or what I say is I think has happened is that the team has to be really, really good with disguising, not showing where you're mm -hmm. going or whatever. That, you can cover all of it. It's if if people can get a beat on you. Even when you think about what Bamba tried to do, where you're trying to show even and you, you know which side did you really go to, run to that kind of thing. <clears throat> That's all part of it. But you know, with this, again, it's not very much different. You just got to be able to hide and not give tip your hand too early. Um, and better teams. The better defenses that really understand the defenses that can move, show something late, uh, you know, um, are going to have the advantage. So, uh, I don't know. I, I like the defense. I mean, you've seen Gary Patterson and other schools really run the heck out of four two five, and I know he's kind of from that tree a little bit. They brought a lot of pressure, and they did a lot of things, as JT has already said. Um you play a man, you got to have some talent, you got to have some speed, all the things we got and that we're going to continue to get. It's really just executing it and calling the things at the right time. That's the part of the, the mm -hmm. coordinator's job is to really know when to call something, you know, whether it's a, a, a base defense or some kind of pressure or, or something of that nature. So I'm feeling good as of right now. We'll just have to see how it all kind of pans out once, uh, you know, they got a lot of time to try to install this. So there's no reason for us to really be feeling too bad about any of it. You got all spring football 
<laughs> you know, they're able to practice without the football now, right? I believe that's the rules that they can mm -hmm. actually. They can go out there kind of whenever they want to, as long as they don't have a ball or any equipment <laughs> on. And... I mean, you, yeah. I, you run routes on air and uh, just have your, your defense covered up based on what they see. Right. And then you can you can even do inside run without a ball. Right. Because you, you just <laughs> right. got to fit. I mean, both both sides. Right. So, yes. Yeah. You're just you're going through the motion. So I think I know that they they have to be doing that. Um, so from a schematic standpoint, I think it should be be good. Like we said, it, you should be able to dial up some pressure and do some things if they if they really want to. Um, but it's just going to be a matter of getting those guys to buy in and, and get after it. And I think they will be um, as well. Okay. So enough on that. I want to end it on this, uh, JT. If we can, I think it would just be remiss because we both know this gentleman and we both um, have seen him. We've been on cruise with him and, and different things. Eli Gold, uh, not going to be doing the game announcing next season or anymore i guess yeah. after that and, uh, it, it's it's an end of an era for sure yeah man it's like everything just switching and changing right i think i saw ali uh call him do something she's like you know what we we gotta i don't know what she said it, it was something to the fact of uh Going and locking all the doors and make sure no one else leave. You know, you got Saban going, <laughs> you got Eli <laughs> yeah. going. I don't know if Sid is left or not, or if he's leaving or or whatever. You know, just so many things. But you know, it's it, it's. I, I think it's okay. You know, I, um, with the shift and the change, right? Uh, I know we'd love to have Eli, and as I said, man, he's called him right now. He talked to me. And do things. He's always positive, and he won't say anything crazy about our. Um, <laughs> what are you laughing at? Corey Wilson. <laughs> once Big Al leaves, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it just you know having have, not having him uh, with us and hearing that sign that voice will be. Um, now that's different. For realism, to say I know that. he's a he's a Notre Dame. I know guy. is he is he is he trying to troll right now? Is yeah, that... man, yeah. He so hey, we, sure. we gotta realism, you gotta you you gotta send me a screenshot of send me the screenshot of the bet. Put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> Show it to me. Yep, that's right. So, um, anyway, thank you to to him. Uh, to Eli for all he's done for the friendship that he's given us and just always keeping it real about stuff and, you know, having him introduce me a lot of times, you know, post um, playing there. Um, so I know we're kind of tied together just because of the, you know, just, just football, uh, Alabama football. But anyway, um, man, it's been great, brother. You know, it's always fun because a lot of times we have guests on here, JT, and I don't ever really tell you this, but it's kind of cool, man, when it's just us hanging out, mm -hmm. talking football, drawing up stuff, doing things. I love having guests on here. I do. Um, but I love just being able to do this and interact with the fans. So thank you to everybody who has been um, chatting with us and doing this. Thank you, uh, Jessica and others who have said that they'll help spread the word about um, Teague's Take. Uh, and you know, as always, those people right there on the screen, make sure you go support them at the Bama Standard because they do a tremendous job um, um, with it as well. So, JT, you need to cue the music, man, because it's about time to get up out of here. Uh, so, you know where to find us. Two weeks from now, we're going to be back. Two weeks from now, we'll have to go I think we got a guest lined up. I'll have to look at uh, Ryan reading. Fowler, I believe. Ryan Fowler, is that who it is? I don't know, it's the calendar might be sitting there. <laughs> so, anyway, we thank y'all. Subscribe, hit that like button. Come back and see us in a couple weeks.